it's gonna be Bedlam. <laughs> See what I did there? You weren't ready for that joke, and I'm gonna keep making it all day. Welcome to Countdown to College Game Day, presented by Samsung QLED TV. We're leading you into game day at 9 a.m., where they're coming at you live from Norman, Oklahoma, the site of Oklahoma of Bedlam, and that's the game that everybody's got their eyes on tonight, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma. If you've never watched this before, Christine Williamson, Jason Fitch, you get to hang out here for the next 30 minutes. We'll get you ready for game day. Also, importantly, you can just authenticate, and then you can stay right here all day. Watch all of the great college football act uh, action throughout the course of the day. Just do it from the ESPN app. So, we like to start things off uh, with a little bit of fire, getting some takes off. We'll start with the top. This is the way it works. Put 40 seconds on the clock, Christine I'm going to get this off my, uh, right. off my chest. Am let's I ready? It. Yeah. All right, let's go. All right, so this is a win elimination weekend for the Big Ten. I'm just uh -huh. saying, Indiana, Ohio State, Northwestern, Wisconsin, all undefeated. We know that. That's fine. But how are they going to separate themselves? We'll find out as at least half of them will be eliminated. I have a sneaking suspicion Indiana will be far less part of the conversation 24 hours from now than they are today. But in 2020, you never know. The more interesting matchup to me is going to be this Wisconsin-Northwestern because we've still seen so much limited action. And Wisconsin is trying to say, hey, don't sleep on us. Those Northwestern, frankly, these are teams that all think the two teams belong in the college football playoff from the Big Ten. But, frankly, two of them will be eliminated. That's my top. What? Second to spare. That was pretty that. solid. I, got an extra I like one. it. All right. All right. Ready? So I, I'll go now. All right. All right. Three, two, one. Since we are in Oklahoma for Bedlam, let's talk about Bedlam because this is a very important game for the Sooners. Not only because, I mean, this game matters for their season, but also because the Sooners have won the last five Big 12 championships. They've also won eight of the last 10 championship games. If Oklahoma loses this game, they are absolutely not going to win the Big, Tel the Big 12 title. And, by the way, uh, this is the first time in a long time, if Oklahoma wins this game, it still doesn't mean that they're going to the Big 12 championship. They are one of three teams. I don't know how much time I have left. They're one of three teams with two losses in the Big 12. So, really, if they win this one, uh... they, still <laughs> they still might not even make it to the title. So, it's a big deal. You know, I had a second left over. I just gifted it to you. All exactly. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the that. top. And now what we love to do is uh, get a little bit of expertise and start running through some games for you. They've been doing this thing since 1904. OU, OSU. This is Bedlam. A huge game in the state of Oklahoma. A lot of state pride on the line. That's the big game of the year. It's going to be an intense game like it should be. All right, we're going to get a little expertise on the entire gambit of games going on over the course of the weekend. Joined now by Tom Lugamill and David Pollack, the incomparable David Pollack, as always. Uh, all right, guys, let's get your thoughts on a bunch of the stuff that we've got over the weekend, but we'll start with Bedlam. So Oklahoma State taking on Oklahoma. Uh, Lugs, what are you looking for in this matchup? I'm really excited about the defense for Oklahoma. I know everybody's talking about the something's got to give between the Oklahoma State defense and the, and the prolific offense of Oklahoma. But the improvement that Oklahoma has made on defense has been glaring, particularly within their front seven. They've been able to get after people. They've created pressures. they created turnovers. They've been a much better tackling team than anything we've seen in the Lincoln-Riley era. And I think that's the reason why this team has grown. Obviously, Spencer Rattler's continuing to grow and develop. People forget he's only a redshirt freshman. But defensively for Oklahoma, that's the difference in this football team right now, in my opinion. So, Pollock, I'll make you take the other side of this equation then. So what's Oklahoma State in your mind have to do to win this game? They got to they gotta create some turnovers. You know, Spencer Rattler, the one thing he did early in the season that he hasn't done since he got benched in the Texas game was, was turn the football over. And actually, since that point, you know, since that halftime on from, from Texas, we're accounting for nine touchdowns, one turnover. So they got to pressure Spencer Rattler. He's going to throw the football. By the way, he's the best in the country I've seen throwing the ball outside of the pocket. He just – he drops dimes. He, he scrambles around and makes plays. He's not the dynamic runner that um, Jalen Hurts was or is powerful, but still has that element to him. So when they get to Spencer Rattler, they better get him on the ground. They do a great job of pressure. Um, but, the, again, the, the, he's sneaky, athletic, sneaky, good in the pocket, sneaky, crafty, so get him on the ground. Before we move off of this game, Paul, I can follow up real quick there. Uh, when you talk about Rattler, obviously we all saw him get a little dinged up last week. When you've got somebody like, I mean, for the mobility that he has and he seems to be struggling a little bit with hip and leg stuff, how concerned are you with that? 
I mean, listen, everybody's dinged up at this point, so, but you have to be concerned with it. But, I mean, you just, it's just something you – that's why the treatment's so daggum good, man. When you look at college football, you, you go get treatment, and they can fix just about all those bumps and bruises as long as it's not anything major. And everybody at this point in the season is playing through some pain, so I expect, I expect them to do the same thing. All right, there's not a lot of pain right now if you're an Ohio State fan. Let's take a look at the Buckeyes, and we'll start here, Lugs, because I always love talking to you about recruiting – we know that they've landed the number one 2020 recruit, like being the top team right now that they are isn't enough. Quinn Ewers headed to Ohio State. Uh, as our recruiting guru, what do you expect for him with the Buckeyes? I, I would expect him to be in the mix the moment he steps on campus. He's really advanced in terms of theory of the game. He will have been a four-year starter at the highest level in the state of Texas, and he's a winner. He understands the game. He anticipates. You see the arm talent. He can make all of the throws. Reminds me of Zach Wilson at BYU. Kind of sneaky athletic, can make throws and change his arm angle. But he's just really gifted, and I think he's advanced. He's going to come out of high school further along than most kids are. When you and I did College Football Live yesterday, you said that you thought he would be the top quarterback even in the existing yeah. class right now. So how big of a blow is it to Texas that had him and now doesn't? Well, it's a blow because it, it – affects the perception of the program. Texas has enough going on right now without having to deal with a top in-state prospect decommitting and going on to Ohio State. That doesn't help just from a pure perception standpoint. The way you fix that, if you're Tom Herman, you continue to win out. That's the only way that you flip that switch. And so you can't cry over spilled milk. You're going to have to go out and replace him. And it starts the moment he decommitted, you are already on the road replacing him. All right, so Pollock, let's talk about the actual team that is playing right now with Ohio State. They're taking on an Indiana team that obviously is taking the world by storm. So how does Indiana compete with Ohio State in this game? Score. They got to score a lot of points. Anytime you play Ohio State and Justin Fields, you can go ahead and put 30 up on the board. So... Michael Penix Jr. is going to have to play out of his mind. And by the way, you see flashes from this kid, man, where you think he is sensational. I mean, he's lefty. He just flicks that thing out of his hands so quick. Um, got a great got great mobility. He's got great receivers on the outside to throw to. They got balance in the running game. So I, I think this Indiana offense has to score. Listen, defensively, they cause pressure. They cause chaos. Um, they create turnovers, and they'll have to do steal a few turnovers to get some more points on the board. But you got to come into the game knowing, like, listen, dude, I've got to get 30 plus. I've got to be aggressive. Fourth and one, fourth and two. That means go for it. Before we move on, real quick, Pollock, you giving Indiana any shot in this game realistically? Yeah, man. I mean, I, I give them a shot. Now I'm not going to sit here and sell you on an, on an upset, but I think they can hang in there with them. Listen. You've seen Ohio State give up points to, to Penn State in bunches. You've seen Rutgers have some success. I really wanted them to see uh, – I, I wanted to see them against Maryland because I think Maryland's offense is really cool and, and really grooving right now too. Um, but I, I think uh, Indiana can score with them for a little while. I just think the depth and the, the annoyingness of Justin Fields because even when you get there and you dial up the perfect – perfect blitz or perfect pressure and you got to get him on the ground and he continues to make plays so I don't think they'll win but I think they can keep it close. Luke you giving them a shot in this one? Well uh, to David's point they're gonna have to create turnovers they've created at least two turnovers in six consecutive weeks that's how Indiana's done this you mentioned the offense they've got explosive guys but generally when you're when the talent is not equitable and in this case it's not Indiana's gonna have to play their best game and Ohio State's probably gonna have to help them a little bit the problem with that is that Justin Fields has yet to turn the ball over this year. So where are the turnovers going to come from if you're Indiana hoping to have a shot? All right, let's give a little bit of love now to the Pac-12, something we don't often have time to do, but we are doing it today. Especially, we'll start with USC. Late tonight, they're going to take on uh, Utah. They're 2-0 and at this point, but they've won incredibly dramatic games. So, Pollock, uh, is this a, a sign of resilience to you or of a sign of a team that's just getting lucky? Well, they got lucky versus Arizona State. You, you get an onside nowadays, you get lucky. Um, you know, Arizona, I, th I think they did a good job and they won the football game and they scored a couple times late to, to take, take the lead, take the lead, give up the lead, take the lead back. USC looks like a, a decent football team to me. They don't look a t like a team that's going to be, you know, contending for a college football playoff spot. I, I know they're behind significantly. Lugs, I just, I'm worried about Slovis too. I, I watched the ball last week and you watch him throw it and it's not, yeah. it's not coming out like I, I, I would expect. It's got... A lot more flutter to throw a couple balls I thought should have been intercepted and Arizona could have actually won the game. They're, they're getting by, but this isn't a team that can run the football, and I, and I don't like what I'm seeing the ball come out of Slovis' hand and the way he threw it a week ago. So I, I don't know what to expect, honestly. I mean, I, go ahead. I, I, I agree with you, David. I think they should be 0-2, to be honest with you. Arizona State should have beat them by 10. 
But I'll give Keaton Slovis credit for this. He played his best football in the last two minutes of both of those games. Played his best football when he had to. There is something not right. I don't know if there's an arm injury, if there's a soft tissue injury going on with him. The ball's not, the, you know, the thing about Keaton Slovis, you recognize him because of his release, that smooth stroke. The ball just comes out so nicely and so effortlessly. And right now it's anything but. So I think SC very fortunate to be 2-0. and And Keaton Slovis has got to get back into a rhythm and play a four-quarter game not just in spurts and then show up in the last two minutes. So one of the interesting news nuggets this week is that the Pac-12 is uh, loosening their scheduling. So they are going to allow teams to look for an out-of-conference opponent. So, Lugs, how aggressive are teams like Oregon and USC going to be trying to add another opponent to their schedule? You're asking the wrong question. You need to ask how aggressive is BYU being in calling every single Pac-12 team and saying, we'll play you right now. And then it's going to say, who's man enough to say yes? Because right now, I think BYU would be in the top two or three teams in the Pac-12. That's how good they are. I had them earlier in the season. Zach Wilson is playing out of his mind. We throw that stat around about Justin Fields and more touchdowns and incompletions. At the same level of the season, Zach Wilson had the exact same statistic for BYU. So, listen, BYU is going to play anybody anywhere. And if I'm a Pac-12 team and I have any sense that I might not have a game going on the schedule, David, I've, I've got to play BYU. I've got to play him. Oregon, you have to sign up and play them. Oregon has to do it. Oregon, you have – Oregon, the O has this much chance to make the college football playoff <laughs> at 7-0. and Right. Zero. You have no chance. You call BYU, you make that game happen. I think it heightens your chance. It heightens the chance for, for BYU as well. I, I wanted to see BYU-Cincinnati. I think they could have made that oh, work too. What awesome. a cool year. What a cool year, by the way, Lugs. Oh. Fitz, we get to talk about, like, mid-season scheduling. Like, hey, you know what? <laughs> yeah. You call up so-and-so and, and see if we can make it work. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the cool things we've gotten throughout this season. But if, I, if I'm BYU, I'm calling USC. I'm calling Oregon. Oh, um, yeah. I, I would listen to Cincinnati because Cincinnati wants to play them, by the way. So make that work. And, David, I'll tell you another thing, too. If I'm Oregon, I'm going to the league and saying, we need to be seen. We need the exposure. Any 9 a.m. kick you got, we're in. We'll do it. We want that window. We need that window if we're going to make a dent and even have a shot to potentially be considered. You guys are the best as always. We appreciate your time and your insight. Boys, stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, man. Appreciate it, dude. Coming up on game day later today at 9.20 a.m., perhaps if you're an Ohio State fan or just into other people suffering, the game day crew will break down what in the world has gone wrong at Michigan and Penn State. All of it. <laughs> Everything has gone wrong. But at 10.05 a.m., all you need is love, or at least that's what Tom Allen and the Hoosiers are selling with their love each other mantra. That has led them to a 4 Oh, start. That's sweet. It is sweet. Then at 10.40 a.m. in the world of Mackenzie Milton, I know I got hurt for a reason. Tom Rinaldi sits down with the UCF quarterback about his road back from a devastating injury. Then at 11 a.m., hello, goodbye. Gino catches up with Hugh Freeze, who in the midst of the second season at Liberty might be getting ready to say goodbye and return to the SEC. I mentioned that story on Mackenzie Milton. We now welcome in Andrea Adelson, who covers Milton at UCF. And we're going to start asking you about that. You know, you talked to him this week. What is the latest with Milton? Mackenzie Milton is back on the practice field. In fact, running scout team for UCF. And when I asked him, okay, tell me how you're feeling physically. He said he's about between 85 and 95%. Now, let me just put that into perspective for people. Two years ago, Nearly to the day, he was injured against USF. He took a hit to his knee that injured his artery. He had nerve damage and he tore ligaments. And doctors said to him, the slam dunk home run outcome for you is to be able to walk again. And now here he is running the scout team for UCF, hopeful that one day, one day soon, he'll be able to play in a game again. It's remarkable what we're seeing from him and, you know, put that in the same category as Alex Smith that yeah. we've seen this year. It's a really incredible recovery. Uh, we're also excited to talk to you, Andrew, because you and David Hale did an, a truly amazing piece 
on Florida State. And there's been a lot of eyes, and we've had a lot of conversation on this show about programs that seem to be on the decline or no longer as relevant. And you, you think about six years ago, this was a Florida State team that uh, was at the top of the world, and now all of a sudden their world's fallen apart while Clemson, their ACC rival, has become the dominant team Florida State once was. In all your reporting and everything you looked at, can you pinpoint – one moment that led to the change in fortunes for the two programs? The biggest has to be a lack of vision and alignment from everybody inside the university, the athletic department, the booster organization, and Jimbo Fisher. Nobody was pulling in the same direction. Everybody had different priorities. For Jimbo Fisher, he saw Clemson coming, so he wanted more money to be able to upgrade their facilities. For the administration, they wanted money to be able to upgrade all programs inside the athletic department. And for the booster organization, they wanted to fund projects that would generate revenue. And you can see where there would be a conflict among all of those groups as the years went on. Jimbo kept pushing and pushing, and he felt as if his requests were met with folks who weren't listening to him. And yes, he did get some upgrades along the way, but eventually the relationships got so frayed that Jimbo, the athletic director at the time, Stan Wilcox, and the head of the booster organization were not even on speaking terms. The unraveling of that relationship is what ultimately got Florida State to the point where it is right now. Uh, you, sorry, you, you were just paused because we know that you're on your phone. So uh, I have, I grew up in Florida, right? I have a lot of friends that went to Florida State. And you wrote about how Florida State fans will often say that in 2017, that's kind of when things started unraveling a little bit. But you also wrote that this actually started in 2014. You mentioned all of the things that were going on behind the scenes. How heavily were they covering up all of that stuff? The winds covered up what was happening inside the locker room. So if the frayed relationships among the administration, Jimbo Fisher and the booster organization were happening behind the scenes inside the locker room, you started to see, see players lose their way a little bit. When they were winning championships, you had Jameis Winston, who was the alpha dog and just pushing his teammates, guys like LaMarcus Joyner, Nick O'Leary, who did not settle for anything less than their best at practice. And then that translated on the football field. But throughout the 2014 season, there started to be just a little bit of a slip there. Players felt as if maybe they didn't have to work as hard. They could win on their talent alone. They still made it to the playoff. But as the years progressed, you didn't have the players inside the locker room pushing each other to be better. There was some selfishness that started to engulf the team. And as one player told me, in 2016, he felt as if if the players didn't get a handle on what was happening, Florida State would end up where it is right now. It's been a snowball effect. And a lot of the players feel, forget about the coach. Let's just talk about the locker room and getting the players on the same page inside the locker room so they can at least play better on Saturdays. Andrea, I think it's interesting because they often say, like college football heads will always tell you, you judge an athletic director by the number of cranes in the air, what construction is being done, right? And so much of your article really does focus on problems monetarily. And so if you're Florida State and you've become worse than bad, you've become really irrelevant, how do you please all of these different factors that want that cash, get it all right and, and become a dominant powerhouse again? That's what Florida State is wrestling with right now. They are in a huge financial hole because of the salaries and the buyout they had to pay for the previous coaching staff, Willie Taggart, somewhere in the area of $30 million. Now you have the pandemic that has hit and Florida State has really suffered in terms of revenue that hasn't been generated by season ticket sales because they've only allowed about 25% of attendance inside the football stadium. They've also had to spend money on COVID testing, cleaning, et cetera. Their athletic director, David Coburn, said today they're going to have to make more massive cuts across the board, and he's worried that the bottom line for athletic budgets inside the sports are now going to have to be cut. Mike Norvell has already taken a pay cut, and maybe even worse than that, their boosters lost 4,000 supporters in the last year. So when you talk about trying to find money for facilities and other upgrades Florida State might need, that is going to be a difficult conversation over the next few months as Florida State grapples with the reality of their financial situation.
You know, as a person that went to University of Miami, I've been talking trash to <laughs> FSU fans for a long time. So now I feel like I can say, I hate to say I told you so. I knew this was going on the whole entire time. Oh, you make it sound like Miami's <laughs> been fine the whole time. I, don't know how <laughs> I just like to talk trash. All right. Thanks so much, Andrea. Appreciate you, Andrea. <laughs> thanks, guys. You're watching Countdown to College Game Day presented by Samsung QLED TV. While there are no fans on site this season, you can still be a part of the action and share your signs. Just a reminder that if you'd like to be on the show this year with your sign, enter for a chance to join at collegegameday.com. And now let's take a look at Fitz's biggest moments brought to you by Samsung QLED TV. Let's take a look at Fitz's biggest moments brought to you by Samsung QLED TV. You know what we do. We look at the four biggest games in the country this weekend. Let's start at number four. Little love for the AAC Cincinnati taking on UCF. Now Cincinnati has scored 40 or more points in three of the last four games. We all know how much greatness we've seen from quarterback Desmond Ritter. So it's easy to think he's the key. He is not. It's the Cincinnati Bearcat defense that needs to stay on fire. They've forced 12 picks this season. This is a big one for them. Let's take a look at the next one on the slate. Number 14, Oklahoma State taking on number 18, Oklahoma. Oklahoma State's often struggled in Kansas, but they hope they have a healthy backfield now coming off the bye. The Oklahoma pass rush should have some success against this Oklahoma State line. It's all going to come down to Spencer Rattler for me. It's been a little bit up and down. We keep talking about the best of the Big 12 offense in several categories for Oklahoma versus the best defense. Who will bend? Who will break? That's the third best game. Let's take a look at the second best game in our mind over the course of the weekend. Wisconsin taking on Northwestern. Yeah, Mertz gets all the glory, but it's the Wisconsin defense we've got to keep focusing on. This has turned into an opportunity for a quality win with the playoff rankings just days away. Quality wins will matter to the committee. Northwestern is undefeated. They are ranked number 19. Wisconsin has the opportunity to show up and show out here to get a key win and keep their claim going towards getting in the playoffs. And of course, the biggest weekend in the matchup of the weekend, we all know it's Indiana and Ohio State. Here's the problem. See, everybody keeps telling you Indiana needs to force turnovers. That's the way they win games. They've got at least two in every game. That's fine. But what do you do when you're taking on Justin Fields, who, remember, has as many inter incompletions as he does touchdown passes this year? That's right. He is absolutely crushing it across the board. Unfortunately for Indiana, what they need here seems to be what Ohio State never does, and that's turn the football over. Those are your four biggest matchups of the weekend. You can't hold me down. I'm ready to be the best quarterback in the country. Yeah, how you like me now? Every day, I'm going to strive to be that. It's what I signed up for. Hey. Field spins and gets to the end zone. Can I been blowing up, blowing up, blowing up. Hit him with a right hook, left hook. Field just continues to be brilliant. But my main goal is to win every game and, of course, win the national championship. Going up, yeah. We now welcome in Steph Odie, who covers the Ohio State Buckeyes. And when you think about Ohio State, they fought pretty hard during the offseason to make a football season happen. And now they're starting and stopping. So what exactly is Ryan Day doing to keep his players ready? Man, he's really been focusing on making sure they get that live game rep experience. They went nearly 10 months without playing real football. And then there's no fans at the horseshoe. So on Saturdays, he brought the guys in and practiced at the shoe without fans. We only had one media availability, so we got to see a little bit. But they're doing everything they can, even at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center. When there's players going to conference rooms to have their press conferences, they are very calculated in who can enter, who's passing each other in the hallways. They're doing so much. And Ryan Day's even going an extra step and staying at a hotel rather than with his family just to prevent positive tests. So. The culture has been huge when it comes to all the, all the adversity they're facing. The parents had protests. They no longer can go to the game this season until maybe the Michigan game. We don't know about that one yet, but parents, families, they can't go to the games anymore. So there's so many changes that they're trying to deal with. And Ryan Day has really helped this team come together and just unite them during all of these issues. So, Steph, we have a top 10 matchup here, although the point spread doesn't really look like it. I mean, at this point, Ohio State's a three touchdown favorite. So for this game tonight, what do you think the key is in this game to keep it close for Indiana? I think it comes down to Ohio State's defense. You know, at the Nebraska game, they saw some issues on the defensive line. And coach said that just happens usually when you have that first game. It just 
takes a little while to get into, but they didn't have those non-conference games to get into a rhythm. But they got back into the Penn State game, and they really showed us that they are the guys that we thought they were. But the secondary is the biggest concern, especially when you're going up against an offense like Indiana. You got Ty Freifogel, Watt Fillior, and Michael Penix Jr. is doing a lot for them. And so the secondary is quite untested. Sean Wade even said, He's not happy with his performance. He knows he can do a lot more. And that's why he came back to Ohio State to play this season. He wants to show them what he can do on the outside. And he just feels like he hasn't done that yet. So I think the secondary is really going to have to show up to put a stop to the Indiana offense. Can we all acknowledge Ty Freifogel is like the best thing? Like, I feel like I walk into a <laughs> restaurant and I'm like, I'll tie the Ty Freifogel. I mean, I, I still say it's the best thing. Go it ahead. actually sounds like it would taste pretty good, too. I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'll try it. Uh, so let's go to the other side of the ball on offense. It's actually really crazy to think about the fact that Ohio State has played so little games. But through three games, Justin Fields has been a straight baller. Uh, the one set that stands out is the fact that he has as many touchdown passes as he has incompletions. So what has been the big Biggest key in his improvement this season. Yeah, he was completely dialed in in this off season. He even said he never thought about opting out. He was always going to stick it through just to see if he had a shot at playing this season. And he went vegan. That was a lot. We talked about that a lot in the off season. He really dissected the playbook. He would talk to Coach Day and position coach Corey Dennis a lot, asking why, rather just what play am I going to do. He wanted to understand why they're calling these plays. He wanted to read defenses better, and he's really slowed the, the game down. So that's going to help when Indiana puts a lot of pressure on him. He's going to be able to slow it down and, and complete his passes. He hasn't had an interception yet. I don't think he will this season. He only had one of the regular season last year. So if there is going to be one, it could happen this game, but I think he's completely locked in. He's, he'll get it done. Well, let's, Steph, give a little love to Indiana here. I mean, the, the other side of the coin is that Indiana has been forcing some turnovers, and the Big Ten has just looked completely out of whack. I mean, Indiana, Northwestern undefeated, Penn State, Michigan, Michigan State all stink. So what's, a, what's allowed, in your mind, Indiana to sort of rise in a strange 2020? I think it comes down to Tom Allen. He's doing so much for this program. And you look at other teams in this conference, it doesn't quite look like some teams want to play for their coach. You look at Michigan and Penn State, and you wonder what's going on. In a season like this, you're greatly tested, and the culture will be exposed. And when you look at Tom Allen in the locker room after that Penn State overtime win, they're screaming, we love you, we love you. They want to play for their coach, and he's brought in some great recruits. And guys that really want to play for him. So I think the culture and what he's doing there is really the reason why they're winning all these games and having success, especially during a year like 2020, and they can become a dominant program in the Big Ten. Tom Allen's credit, I saw on the broadcast last week that he has broken his two front teeth in celebration, so he's going hard that. for that program. I mean, you can't, you can't knock that. You can't knock that. All right, thanks so much, Steph. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. All right, Fitz, we do a show called Rankings Reactions on Tuesdays. It's at 8 p.m., 8 to 9 p.m. on Tuesdays. Just hang out with us and Mike Golick Jr. Yeah, Mike Golick Jr. Great. We let Mike Golick Jr. join us, really, is what this comes down to. Like, Gojo needs to get all the Notre Dame blech out of his yeah. body, so we let him hang out exactly. with us. Exactly. That's the reason we let him hang out. But the first, the first rankings comes out on next Tuesday. So we're going to do our... We, you did your week too early ranking, so we're just going to do it again. Yeah. We're going to let Fitz do it again, and I'm going get to get in on the action. So, Fitz, your top four. Yeah, so here's my – and actually, you've got my top six here. Perfect. And what you'll see is I have Ohio State at number one, and a lot of people have a problem with that. But I, for me, I, we haven't seen enough football to see bad football from Ohio State. We ha Certainly, I know anybody can question defense, but I'll question the defense of several of these teams. Alabama's defense, for example, has just taken a couple of games off. So I think that there's we're splitting hairs between one, two, right, to me for Ohio State, Alabama. I still think that Notre Dame, while it was an incredible win over Clemson, will end up out of this by the time it's all done. But I'll put Clemson in at four. You lose on the road in double wow. overtime to wow. Notre Dame with your backup quarterback missing a bunch of starters. I put Clemson in four. You know I'm giving a lot of love to the group of five at this point. And so I've got Cincinnati at five, BYU at number six. That's where I feel on it. So where are you, Christine? Okay, so I'm kind of almost the same with the top four. Look Alabama at, at number one. Because, I mean, like you said, Ohio State, they're doing great, but we've only seen three games out of them. So, like, let's just kind of give, give the love to the SEC Alabama team. Uh, after that, I have Notre Dame because, like you said, they did win two clip or win two Clemson. They did beat Clemson. Um, but, like you said, also, Trevor Lawrence wasn't there. They were missing three defensive start starters. And next, I have Florida because... <laughs> 
I know you're looking at me right no, now. No, I think the Florida oh, picture a good one. I, be, okay, here's the thing. They have Kyle Trask, right? They have one loss. It was to Texas A&M. Nobody expected Texas A&M to win that game. I have like three seconds. BYU after that because of Zach Wilson, and, and I just feel like Cincinnati has a lot more to prove. No problem with Florida yeah. there. I think Florida will end up in this conversation. What I know is you should stick around for game day. Thank you so much for Christine Williamson. I'm Jason Fitz. Thanks for watching Countdown to Game Day presented by Samsung QLED TV. Keep hanging out That was with us. great. Good job.